This is the final Word T20 World Cup Daily, day 27, second semi-final day. Jeff Lemon and Matt Roller of ESPN Crick Info with you. And you're with us and uh, the show's with you for Westfield London, Westfield Stratford City as always. Today was it, the second semi, working out who's going to the final on the weekend. Matt, can you please tell me all about the game in the space of 30 seconds? Yeah, the answer is India, and they were absolutely dominant, really. I think they outthought, outplayed, outclassed England. Uh, they were asked to bat first, which was possibly the wrong call by Joss Butler at the toss. Uh, India got 171 for seven, which always felt uh, way too many, really. Uh, and that so it proved England bowled out in exactly 100 balls, fittingly, uh, for 103. Uh, Aksar Patel, very, very good. Jasper Bumra, very, very good. And Kuldeep Yadav, very, very good. I think India are probably... Um, the favourites heading into Saturday's final? I think they're comfortably the favourites, judging from what we saw today. T- today felt like it, a belting in a in a sort of moral and spiritual sense. It, it wasn't the biggest margin you'll ever see. It was still a pretty big one, but, you know, it wasn't a 150 runs or something like that. It wasn't something getting chased in three overs. It wasn't a side being bowled out for 50 like Afghanistan were last night, but... England after um, there were about three overs of the chase and there were about two overs at the top of the the batting innings where it looked like they might be in the in the game you know two overs in the first three in the second and then after that they just got thumped on on every front and it was it was a difficult surface today the ball was keeping low and I thought India managed that with the bat so well that by the time they got 170 at, at the halfway mark, it, it seemed almost a foregone conclusion that they would be able to defend it. It felt like they were saying maybe 20 too many. It, it felt more like 40 or 50 too many to me, given just how low the ball was keeping at times and how much um, assistance there was for spin at different times of the innings. Yeah, I'd agree, I'd agree wholeheartedly with everything you've just said there, to be honest, Jeff. I think uh, heading into this game, there was a fair bit of narrative about England's hammering that they inflicted on India and Adelaide a couple of years ago. Uh, which was a 10-wicket win with four overs to spare. And to be honest, even though uh, the margin was slightly different today, it, it felt like a similar type of a, a, a complete comprehensive uh, victory, which which leaves England looking in a not great spot, to be honest. Uh, they obviously have effectively beaten associates in West Indies in this World Cup and lost their games against Australia, South Africa and India. Um, and India just completely outplayed them, I thought, to be honest. Rohit Sharma... Uh, who was so sluggish in that, that game in Adelaide a couple of years ago. I think he got 27 off 28 balls that day on a, a real belter of a pitch. This was completely the opposite, where he got 57 off 39 on a really, really tough, low surface and, and was massively rewarded for really all of the things that he's talked about since that Adelaide game, which is, you know, playing the right way, playing with intent throughout. There were, there were quite a few, you know, there were a few sort of half chances in, in the power play, but he was rewarded for the intent that he had throughout where, you know, Miss hits weren't carrying to fielders or uh, balls were just plugging the right place for him. But that sometimes is, is the result of playing with, with great intent. And I think as soon as he got away from me, particularly after, you know, the thing I missed in the story of the day is that there's been long rain breaks at various points. And I think it, it was about an 80 minute stoppage, maybe it, when there was a big downpour sort of halfway through in India's in innings, or uh, about eight overs in, I should say. Um, and pretty soon after that, you know, there were a couple of slightly soft overs, but pretty soon after that, Rohit and Surya Kumar Yadav just started nailing it. And pretty much throughout that that phase, it felt as though even though England spinners were, were sort of going okay, you know, Rashid and Livingston had one for 48, 49, I think, in eight overs between them, which is sort yeah. of fine. But as soon as that happened, you thought, well, this is going to be a complete bloodbath when you have Jadeja, Akshar and Kuldeep on it. Uh, and so it proved, I think, yeah, England for all of their IPL experience facing it, facing India's bowlers for all of their experience over in the Caribbean. It, this in South America is a completely different pitch. It's somewhere they've not played in 14 years. It's somewhere they've only known they were going to be playing for a couple of days, and and fundamentally they looked, you know, ill-equipped to deal with what they faced today. With both both with the ball and with the bat, I thought they were you know too many slower balls. They should have just bashed a hard length. They should have bowled more spit. They probably didn't need to pick four seamers. Um, in fact, they certainly didn't need to pick four seamers, uh, and they looked pretty clueless as to, to how to keep India out, let alone score off. Um, so yeah, yeah a, a, a real jabby king. 
there were there were enough periods where where England seamers bowled a full length and got punished for that. There's there's that Jordan over where he gets hit for two sixes down the ground by Hardik Pandya, then gets him out going for the third one, and then nicks off Shivam Dubé. I don't know if I've seen a lot of bowlers on a hat trick after going for two consecutive sixes, but almost by that point the wickets didn't matter that much. The damage was done. Um, they've they've worked their way down to Jadeja and Akshar by the end, but Jadeja takes a dozen off the 19th over, which Arch is bowling. Akshar hits another six off Jordan. They take 12 off that last over as well even though Akshay gets out off the second last ball so it just it felt like India were were timing their run with the bat well enough and and that's sort of the case early as well so Kohli gets out in the third over hits a six and then tries to to double down against Topley and loses his leg stump and and that was just before that was the point where there was a little bit of a few iffy moments where there's only a couple of boundaries in the first two overs Rohit gets one sliced away off an outside edge and one's a cut shot straight at Phil Salt's head that that Phil Salt's trying to duck and catch at the same time he's just trying to get out of the way but also try to leave the hands up Um, but after those two early moments that that were a little bit bit iffy for Rowett and then Coley gets out Rishabh Pant comes and joins him doesn't make many gets out just before a, a short rain delay but once Surya Kumayadov comes back with Rowett it's it just looked quite easy for them like they managed to they, they'd gauged that it was a difficult surface they didn't try to go for everything they didn't hack across the line until Rowett did once he was past 50 but by that point they'd done enough damage you had the the Surya Kuma sort of uh, lap shot that he plays off Jordan that sails away for six. You've got um, the, the the sweeps that Rowett's playing against Adil Rashid to pick off the, the bad balls there, a couple of boundaries there, which which Rashid hasn't been giving away many boundaries. Uh, and then you've got that... They, they just punctuated it with these moments. There's a square drive from Surya Kumar that goes over deep backward point for six and somehow carries amazing shot. And then a single and then a ball later, Rowett plays the down on one knee scoop shot over the shoulder the AB de Villiers sort of lap shot over over deep backward square leg almost which I don't remember seeing him play I'm not saying he never has but but Rowett's more a conventional slog sweeper or a puller I don't remember him seeing the the dink over the shoulder shot before but once you put the, all of those things together there were enough boundaries coming and they were working the bowling well enough in between time that they set it up for um, their lower order hitters to be able to do enough at the end and and you know 170 that that felt massive on that pitch yeah absolutely I think the way that people have spoken about the surface and the build up to this I was thinking and the way it played straight away as well I mean Joffre Arch was first over he just hammered a length that you know some balls shot, shot through quite low some shot through very low and it, it wasn't like it was a variable bounce type of pitch like the one in uh, Taruba where some were up and some were down it was down or even further down down or underground uh, yeah and I think as, as soon as as soon as I actually, I, to be honest, I think one of the turning points you, you kind of alluded to it there with with the Suya six over point and then the Rohit slog sweep, but that nineteen run over Sam Curran and the thirteenth over. I mean, from one hundred and ten to two after thirteen overs, India were were so far ahead of the game. I think at that stage, I think you know they they could probably have batted a couple more overs and declared and still have won this game. Um, they, they, that was that was pretty much game over. I think, um, and yeah, they it sort of feels from an Indian point of view as though they, they've just changed so much as a T20 team. I think that a T20 performance like, you know, if India were drawn playing Guyana in a T20 World Cup and almost any other previous year, that it would have been all about the openers trying to bat for as long as possible. Whereas today, Rohit, you know, took risks um, that he felt were, were necessary on this pitch and, and ended up getting them so far ahead of par that it was pretty much, you know, I, I don't know what the win, win predictor or win viz would have said at half time, but it, it felt to me as though it was much more likely that we're going to get bowled out for 100 as they did than uh, chase it down. I think it was pretty close. I think it, at the innings break, it was it was roughly it was fifty something to forty something. You know, standard sort of two party preferred referendum polling kind of stuff, with a with a pretty ordinary margin for error. But it felt. I mean, we were talking about it uh, where, where we were at the break. It did feel more like seventy thirty even at that point. Uh, it, and there's there's a bit there's there's a there's a twitch sort of in the heart monitor when. Butler comes out. He he nicks Boomer for four, which is which is fortunate. But you know they get eight off a of Boomer over, which is a big win against Boomer because he's going at four and over through this tournament. And then Ashdeep Singh gets, gets clobbered in the third over of the innings. Um, there's that. There's a slap over mid off that's almost caught, but it's, he's just got enough elevation. Butler, and then he gets a one down the leg side that he pulls fine, and then he nails a pull shot through mid wicket. So suddenly I think thirteen off that over. 
They're 26 for none after three, so they're broadly up with the rate. You know, eight and a half is what they need, and that's the, the only moment where it feels like England are in the game. And then first ball of the fourth, plays the reverse sweep to Akshar, and we saw, we saw so many balls. We saw a ball, I think, from Adil Rashid, or it was either Rashid or Livingston, that, that literally stopped in the pitch and then almost rolled along the ground. So tacky was that surface at times. And Akshar gets one to jam in the surface. It takes the toe of the bat, it lobs up over Rishabh Pant, and he's able just to trot back and take the catch. And that's pretty much it. Like once once Butler's gone, nothing works for, for England after that. Then you've got Boomer bowling a fucking off break at about 148 k's an hour to Phil Salt that somehow turns. It like it didn't cut, it didn't jag, it turned and takes out his leg stump while Phil Salt's trying to murder it off a length. Just I mean, there's no shot to play to that ball, but particularly not that one. Ridiculous stuff. So it's 34 for two and then 35 for three when, when Besto t- tries to play a similar sort of shot to Akshar Patel and gets bowled. Um, Mo and Ali stumped in the next over off Akshar and then and because the, they've sent him up as, to try to do a left-hand, right-hand thing and then they try to send up Curran to do the same and he's LBW to cool deep for two. They're 53 for five. I mean, it was just over so quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I think as soon as Butler was out, it felt like it was curtains. It felt like it was the sort of game where Butler was going to need to get 80 uh, and 80 pretty quickly as well. Um, yep. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, we, we didn't actually mention this with Rohit, but I think that the shot that he played, the first ball of spin that England bowls from Adil Rashid, Rohit reverse swept for four, and the first ball of spin that India bowls, Butler reverse swept to Pan. Uh, and that right. was pretty much, pretty much the, the tale of the game, I thought. Uh, not Not necessarily... I don't think that says anything in particular about Butler as such. It's just that, uh, you know, one of these teams is feels like they're in a moment and is a complete side at the moment. And one is, you know, in a, in a state of slight transition after, after a lot of success. Um, I think I actually, before this game, I had to write a sort of preview as to what cricket in at the stadium is like based on sort of CPL and stuff. And I had a chat with Chris Green, the Australia off spinner, who's played a lot of games here in the CPL. I think he's played just about as many as anyone else. Um, and he basically said that the template in, a, in, a, in the CPL in a day game is you have to really over-attack the power play because of the fact that it's only going to get harder to score as you go. So right. I don't really attach any particular blame to, to Salt or Butler for, for taking attacking risks in the power play. I think chasing 170, they, you know, the only route to, to winning was probably to score 60-odd of those in the power play and hope that they could somehow survive through the middle. Um, but obviously it's easier to sort of say those things about a template when you're in a league situation where you know you can afford to drop the odd game if, if your yep. over, over a commitment to attacking shots comes off. Whereas in a in a World Cup semi final, if it doesn't come off, you're you're toast, and that was exactly what happened to England. It had the very similar vibe to the um, to the 2021 COVID Test series, really in Ahmedabad, when uh, Johnny Bairstow was bowled by Axel Patel the first ball of that over. It just just felt like um, you know you shut your eyes and you were uh, watching a, a, a sort of half full stadium, uh, and uh, it was it was it was pretty grisly through the middle. Brook played a couple of nice shots, but. Um, you know, it, it was it was completely game over by the time England had finished the power play. They were thirty nine for three. They needed a miracle, and uh, miracles don't happen very often. Yeah, look, I didn't think there was any problem with with Butler or Salt going for it. I suppose if there's one thing for Salt, it's maybe you don't try to absolutely mow Boomer the way he's bowling at the moment. But those those slower balls that he was bowling were gripping in the wicket and and moving extravagantly off the seam. Absolutely ridiculous stuff. Harry Brook looked really good for a little while there. There was that straight sweep from Kuldeep Yadav. He plays the cut shot beautifully against Jadeja where he picks the gap. They've got a deep cover sweeper out, but he beats that sweeper straight and then plays the reverse well against Kuldeep for four and then, and then doubles down, tries to play it two balls in a row, moves across too far, gets bowled behind his legs for 25. They needed 12 and over at that point. Jordan LBW to Kuldeep Yadav. Um, Joffre Archer comes out, belts a six and then runs out Liam Livingston in one of the worst pieces of running I've ever seen. I mean, it's gone to short, fine leg. It is not Archer's call. Livingston's running. He's saying yes. He's saying run. And Archer looks up and goes, no, I think I'll go back into my ground. No, like if Livingston honestly should have just kept running. He should have just run to the striker's end and said, too bad, mate, piss off. Like, you know, go and walk at this point because Livingston was their only slight outside prayer that he might suddenly be able to get on one. But I, I, it would have been too hard for him. I think he ends up run out for 11 off 16, couldn't find the boundary, could only find singles. Archer belts a six and a four uh, off Pandya and then Adil Rashid's run out. 
turning back to the non-strikers end. Archer's LBW Boomer hit on the on the back heel to end the game, which is an unusual one coming so far across his stumps to sweep. So just complete annihilation from India. We've talked about this before during this World Cup about just how complete they look at the moment. You look at three for 19 from Kuldeep, three for 23 from Akshar Patel and two for 12 for Boomer from 2.4 overs. Plus they've been good enough to affect a couple of run outs. Plus they've got, their batting has worked perfectly where they've used every player who is good enough that you want them to bat and none of the players who are not good enough that you'd rather they didn't have to bat. Uh, basically everything except Arshdeep's third over went well for India today. And it's, I, I, I really, I find it hard to see a scenario unless South Africa get a pitch like they got against Afghanistan and get the ball to jag where South Africa is going to be able to do anything against a team with every base covered. Yeah, and yet it, there is also that slight sense of you know unstoppable force and immovable objects with mm. South Africa's record in in knockout games and India's recent record in knockout games. Like this could be could be one of the most hilariously terrible finals where both teams are somehow conspiring to lose. But I think it'll be a really good game. I think um, I think it's it's un, un, undoubtedly, in my opinion, the best two sides in the tournament. They're both un, undefeated at this point. Um, it, it feels like it's it's the right final. Uh, but yeah, it is very very difficult to look past India at this stage like the only thing as as you say is if they potentially you know get get put in early in the morning and um for the first time all of the top order don't come off Janssen and Rabada sort of run through them but even that I find hard to hard to see and and I suppose the big difference with India now to what they were a few years ago is that they bat until number eight in a way they never used to um you you always felt with India they, they were probably vulnerable if they lost a couple early because they would have to consolidate but there feels like there's enough faith in the in the side and faith in the batting depth that they'll, they'll keep attacking if that happens so yeah I, I think India go into that as big big favorites um but yeah and, and based on their based on their performance today it's it's about as dominant as it gets I think you you often see big teams come up with big performances in semi-finals like England did at the last T20 World Cup and it, it felt like another sort of statement win from India saying you know this is um, and obviously with the whole backdrop of having you know, sort of the, the, the narrative that has been um, playing out across the press in the past few days about the, the lack of reserve day for this game and the fact that India had the predetermined guy on the semi-final. It almost felt like them, you know, really asserting their authority on this World Cup and saying, yep, this is this is our tournament. We're here to win it. We're not messing it out. Um, sorry, England. This is this is our game now. Yep. <laughs> it's our time. It's our time. All right. It's our time for a quick break. We'll be back in a second. It's the final word. T20 World Cup Daily Jeff Lemon and Matt Roller it's brought to you by Westfield London Westfield Stratford City you may or may not know this Matt but throughout his career Michael Atherton apparently kept a collection of Ernest Hemingway short stories in his kit bag Um, there may be some England fans who rue the fact that Michael Atherton was not carrying around a copy of The Old Man Who Didn't Keep Nicking Off to Glenn McGrath but Hemingway had no love for cricket he famously said the only real sports were bullfighting motor racing and mountaineering everything else was simply a game so if you like Ernest Hemingway like motor racing you can go to Westfield London at 11am on the 3rd of July to meet Formula One drivers Nico Hulkenberg and Kevin Magnussen they sound very impressive individuals thanks to Chipotle I don't know what Chipotle have done to bring in Formula One drivers but they're doing it somehow and also if you go between July 3rd and July 5th you can get your picture taken with the Haas Racing Team show car and try your hand at their racing simulator Westfield London Ernest Hemingway would have hated it but you won't slightly Hemingway vibe to your your wanderings over the last little while because nobody else basically was able to get to Guyana to cover this particular match. Nobody could get out of Guyana afterwards, more to the point, to get back for the final in Barbados. You, Matt Roller, have managed to forge a solitary path and find yourself at the ground today to to watch India flex their muscles. Uh, tell, tell us about how this all went down. Well, I'm hoping that I've managed to do the second half of that and get back to Barbados for the final. I'm yet to check in for my flight tomorrow and I've got this horrible sense of dread emerging over me that I'm going to do it, try and do it and it's going to say this flight that I booked two and a half months ago has suddenly been cancelled or something like that. But no, thankfully here I am. Uh, I had the big advantage over the rest of the UK English press pack that uh, I, you know, Sid Monga, my colleague, and I split up these semi-finals uh, in April and committed to going to Trinidad and Guyana, respectively, regardless of which teams were in it. Whereas the, the rest of the English press was sort of scrambling around on Monday and Tuesday, trying to get last-minute flights. Uh, there's not a hell of a lot of flights from Bridgetown to Georgetown 
Uh, there's not a hell of a lot of flies generally at the moment in the Caribbean because one of the, the local airlines, Liat, went under in the, as a result of the pandemic, really. Um, and there's even fewer hotels in Georgetown. It's, it's a seriously, you know, I think people think about Ghana in a cricketing context as a name that they hear, but I don't think they think yeah. about it as someone that borders Venezuela and Suriname and is the fastest growing economy in the world because of the fact that it's just found 11 billion barrels of oil off the coast. Um it's a really, really surreal thing. My my first time in South America is this sort of mini business trip, uh, three nights in Georgetown's only boutique hotel, um, mm. and sort of being driven around by these absolute cricket aficionado taxi drivers. I had a guy, the first the first guy I spoke to um, on landing in, in Guyana within about five minutes was telling me about how uh, it, how much of a joke it was that Shamar Joseph hadn't been playing for West Indies, and the guy who was dropping me <laughs> off on the ground today. It similarly had these massively strong takes where he, he was he was saying uh, he specifically identified a moment in the Super 8 game between West Indies and England, which I think we were both at in St. Lucia, where he said that when uh, Rovman brought the quicks back, that was like giving the English batters a cup of coffee. It just woke them up and suddenly that was the game <laughs> sorted there and then. Pretty much West Indies <laughs> World Cup there and then. And I have to agree, yeah. really, but... Um, yeah, there have been some surreal moments in the past couple of days, uh, not least because of the fact that I think I'm into my what, 11th hour um, at Providence Stadium covering a T20 game. It feels like yes. it's been a hell of a long day. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely has been, been a long day with all the rain breaks and so on. Um, quick Hall of Fame nominations for me, aside from the Boomer delivery, uh, which was outstanding. Um, Joss Butler doing the little throw the back leg out to pretend I'm going to back away so that you bowl it down the leg side. I cannot believe that Ashdeep Singh got suckered by that. Joss Butler does that all the time. He does it like every second over. I've watched him do it probably 15 times during this T20 World Cup. Um, and Ashdeep Singh still goes, oh, like you can tell because he sticks his leg out sort of perpendicular to the ground, which looks completely different to what it, what happens when he actually backs away to the leg side. His fake backing away is so clearly a fake backing away that like when you just punt it down the leg side because he's done that, that was that was that was just a sucker and, and his money are easily parted. Um anything else for you on the Hall of Fame? Yeah, just just a quick one, um, because of the fact that today could well prove to be, I think, uh Moen Ali's last appearance as an international cricketer, I thought despite the fact that I think Moen Ali has achieved a hell of a lot for England and I think he's been a great player for them over across formats over the past decade it did somehow seem fitting that his his final game was um you know didn't get bowled with the ball when he probably should have got punted up the batting order to number three uh and then had a slightly comical dismissal where Rishabh Pant took admittedly a very good stumping but um it, it wasn't a pretty one for Mo on the replay and yep. somehow I seem to sum up a, a career where despite everything that he's achieved it, it just has been weird he's been asked to do so many different roles so many different things yep. at various different times um, and, and you know is simultaneously a bits and pieces player in this England side and their vice captain um, and, yeah. and that sort of that sums up Moen Ali for me yeah and, and, and something about that England team that just didn't convince me throughout was was going okay you've got Curran you've got Moen you've got Livingston um, and they're all at one time or another in your top six it just just didn't feel like a solid cricketing side with that sort of option but uh, all right that career may have come to an end. This show has come to an end. We will let you tr finally try to leave Providence Stadium. Matt Roller, thanks for joining The Final Word and being part of the daily throughout this World Cup. There's only one daily to go. Maybe we'll do a preview show. We'll work that out. But the final is coming. It's India, South Africa. India winners today by 68 runs. Uh, sign up to support the show on patreon.com slash the final word if you want you can get it without ad breaks as well on there and uh, thanks to Westfield London Westfield Stratford City all right we're out of here Matt go well hope to see you in Barbados for the final ciao